All right, we're all set. The chair knows the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everold Henry. Present. Mr. Philip White. Present. Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Ms. Chris Brestrup, Planning Director for the Town, uh, Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town, and, and serving as our counsel uh, on this matter, Carolyn Murray of KP Law. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will, make, will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, in Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Any, and, they, and they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to seek additional information. After the board has completed its question, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and, the, and input from the public is gathered, followed by a public meeting for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on, on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a public hearing, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision, or a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces, common areas and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested waivers from the zoning bylaws, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, and sewer water connections approvals at 2040 Ball Lane, map 5A, parcel 56, res RN, neighborhood residential, and RLD, low, residential, low density residential zoning districts, and FC, farmland conservation overlay districts. That will be followed by a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight and other business anticipated within the last 48 hours. Tonight's first order of business is to open consideration on ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation's request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B. Are there any disclosures by members of the board? Uh, we will disclose that we've not had a site visit yet, but that will be coming up soon. We'll have more hearings on this topic, um, so a site visit will be will be planned. I want to run through the submissions. Excuse me, Mr. Judge. 
I yes. think Ms. Um, Greenbaum may have a disclosure. Oh, no. I didn't see your hand, Gilda. No, I don't have a disclosure, but I have a question. I see that there are 30 people in the room, and I'm wondering if you could enable the, the um, whatever you call it, that lets us to see who the other people are who are watching from the audience. I, I don't know that we have the bandwidth to do that. I mean, for we the did last week. So if you... So if you actually go to your um, bottom part of your screen, Hilda, where it says participants, if you click on that, you'll see a panel yeah, come up on your right. So if you go to the right, you'll see two different tabs you can click on. One that says panelists and one that says attendees. If you click the one that says attendees, you can see who is in attendance in the audience. Oh, here it is. I didn't go down far enough. Okay, thank you. No oh, but it got, I thought you were asking for a video um, feed for each of those people. But no, no, no. Just the list. Yeah. Okay, great. I misunderstood your question. It's easy uh, to easy enough done. Uh, uh, submissions ahead. we've received on this application: a cover letter signed by Jessica Allen, the research project manager, Valley CDC, or the real estate project manager, excuse me, dated September nineteenth, twenty twenty-three. A project narrative, the ZBA FY twenty twenty-four dash zero three application form, ZBA FY twenty twenty-four zero three management plan. Mass Housing Project Eligibility Letter, dated 5-25-23, a property deed, a list of development team members. We also received impact analysis of the natural and built environment, a list of requested zoning waivers, pro forma, a traffic assessment report, stormwater pollution prevention plan, architectural plans designed by Austin Design, dated September 8, 2023, earthwork plan designed by Joshua Klein, um, PE, Stonefield Engineering and Design, dated September 8, 2023. Illustrative Site Plan, designed by Peter Finkel, RLA, Dotson and Finkler, designed, dated September 8, 2023. Site plans, um, there are numerous site plans, which include a cover sheet, a condition, existing condition plan, a demolition plan, a site, C4 site plan, grading plan, stormwater management plan, utility plan, Lighting plan, soil erosion and sediment control plan, construction details, site management plan, site layout plan, a planting plan, plan schedule and details, site details, paving and furnishings, site details, fencing, uh, a truck turning plan, including a plans, including a fire truck turnaround and a trash truck turn, as well as meeting dates and uh, schedule, as well as topics. We also have received um, several public comments. I want to run through those quickly. We've received public comments from um, an email on of October 6th from Jeff Fishman and Sarah Killian, an email from October 13th from Andy Churchill. On 10-16-23, we received an email from Jessica Pydade and Carol Lewis, co-chairs of the Amherst Municipal Affording Housing Trust. And on 10 18 23, we received an email from Steve King and Meg Gage. I think that's all of them, isn't it? Rob, any others? Could you repeat the last name, Mr. Chairman? My apologies. It's uh, an email dated 10 18 2023 from Steve mm -hmm. King and Meg Gage. That is, yep. Th those are all the comments that we have received so far. This application proposes a significant housing development, including 30 new homes. As such, it will require several meetings of the ZBA to complete consideration of a comprehensive permit. Members of the ZBA have agreed to meet on alternate Thursdays when we do not normally meet to accelerate consideration of this proposal and to avoid delaying other matters that we will have that will come before the board in the next few months. I wanna thank all the board members for their willingness to put in this extra time to hear this important proposal. Tonight, we hope to get a general overview of the project from the petitioner Future meetings will have a specific topic, such as site design, landscape, architecture, stormwater, stormwater management, property management, etc. Um, and most importantly, we're, we're going to hear how the home ownership program is structured, including conditions under which the homes may be sold in the future. Considerations of a comprehen comprehensive permit is a little different than considerations of most of our special permits. For example, under 40B, all of the municipal permits and any other matters not governed by state law are going to be decided by the ZBA. 
One provision of Chapter 40B provides that the CBA with, provides the CBA with full discretion to approve or deny the request for a comprehensive permit if 10% or more of the town's housing stock is affordable. 11% of Amherst housing stock is affordable, so we qualify for this safe harbor. The ZBA must make this decision within 15 days of opening a public hearing on this matter. I want to avail ourselves of this protection of the safe harbor at the onset of this hearing, so we do not inadvertently forget to do so. So I would entertain a motion to, to invoke the safe harbor provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40B, and then we can discuss the motion on the safe harbor. Carolyn Murray from KP Law is here. Perhaps you can give us a um, the right formulation of that motion, so we make that uh, have that mo have the correct motion in front of us. Is there anything special we have to say on this? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chairman. I I don't know if um, I did actually prepare a motion to invoke the safe harbor in writing. I don't know if that has been uh, shared or put in your, in your packets or not, but I'm happy to read it. That would be and great. It could certainly be invoked at that point. So the motion would be that the board determine that the town of Amherst has achieved one of the statutory minima standards set forth under general law chapter 40B, sections 20 through 23 and 760 CMR 56, 0.033 because the town subsidized housing inventory as maintained by the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, formerly the Department of Housing and Community Development, on the date that the application for a comprehensive permit was received from Valley Community Development for the property located at 20 to 40 Ball Lane comprises more than 10% of the town's total housing units. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Chair, that, that would be the entirety of the motion. Great. I'm not going to repeat that, but I think you can, <laughs> if you will send that copy for the record to Rob so we can put it in the minutes. I um, will do that. I would entertain a motion that incorporates uh, Attorney Murray's uh, stated motion. Is there such a motion? I'll move. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. Is there a discussion? If there's no discussion, uh, the vote occurs on the motion um, to invoke the safe harbor. This requires a simple majority of the board. I would, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Oh, you're, you're muted, Craig. Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Great. So we've got that business out of the way. Now I'd like to turn to the uh, presentation by the petitioner to give us an overview of the, of the project. So who's gonna be presenting for uh, Valley Community Development tonight? Uh, please give your name and address uh, and then um, proceed with your presentation. Sure, my name is Jessica Allen. Um, a Excuse me, may I interrupt just for a minute? I think that um, Carolyn Murray has a question or a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, just, and I, I see Everell Henry does too as well. My yes. my apologies, Mr. Chair. I um so as a result of the of the motion that you've made, the board, because you have achieved a safe harbor, is in a position that the board can either deny the comprehensive permit or the board yeah. can elect to proceed with the hearing. Um I sense by virtue of you calling upon the applicant to present that uh, the board wishes to proceed with the full hearing, but understanding that the board does have the right to either deny the application or to approve it with conditions and that the applicant does not have um, a right of appeal given that situation. Yes, do we need, I don't, we don't need a, a motion to proceed to consideration, do we? No, not unless anyone um, on the board wishes to make a motion to deny the comprehensive permit. If you're going to go forward with the hearing, then no, there's no need for a motion. All right. And then lastly, sorry, Mr. Chairman, and then yep. I promise I will be quiet. Fine. <laughs> um, lastly, um, we do have to send a notice, a uh, formal notice in writing to both the applicant as well as to the Office of Housing and Livable Communities indicating that we have invoked the safe harbor. The applicant does have an opportunity to challenge that if they so choose. Um, so I would just ask 
that um, the board authorized the chair to execute that letter, which um, again, I did draft that. So I think Christine has that. We could put it on your letterhead and get that out if you if you wouldn't mind. Without objection, um, unless there is an objection, I would de declare that the board has authorized me to send such letter. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I, I read the packet um, in a few times, and one of the provisions that the board has been asked to consider is 3.01, which in a in couple of our last hearings, we had conversations around where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other. And we had issues with that language. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned that we are here um, considering that provision. I believe in our last discussions, we were gonna get touch base with the legal to have some clarity on complementary. So I, I just want to put that on the record that um, I, I have some reservations given the fact that in our last hearings where the petitioner came before us under that provision, we essentially deferred because of that language. That's an excellent point, Mr. Henry. Um, two things. Number one, we're going to have several more hearings on this, so there'll be number uh, numerous numerous opportunities to deal with that issue of uh, complementary use. And secondly, I think for our next meeting, which is on the twenty sixth, I think we've said that will be the topic. Will be that specific um, provision. And so we'll, you will, we will all have a chance to hear from the building commissioner on his recommendations. We can make a judgment at that point in time about how we wish to interpret, how we think we should be or advised to, to in interpret that provision. So I think we're going to have sufficient time to evaluate that before we move to any decision or dis uh, to dispense with this motion or this application one way or the other. So I think we've got some time to, we might as well start on the process pending the further um, information we'll receive next week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Okay. Mr. Wachilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make the point that um, in terms of this specific um, permitting process, so usually the ZBA makes findings under section 10.3A of the AMR zoning bylaws for any special permit or variance that comes, well, oh, sorry, just special permits that come before them. In this case, the findings that the board's going to make are actually from section 4.5 of the ZBA rules and regulations, which reflect the uh, conditions for comprehensive permits under chapter 40B. So essentially the scope of the findings you're going to be making while hearing this permit today are slightly different than the ones that we're used to in those other hearings. So just keep that in mind as well. And also the ZBA doesn't have to be constrained by the provisions of the Amherst bylaw as well when deciding on this case. So that's another important thing to keep in mind too. So we know section 3.01 was very, you know, paramount in previous permits, but you know, in this one, this, the board doesn't really have to be constrained by it necessarily, but you do bring up an, an important point about that. Um, so I just wanted to say that for the record so folks can keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wachilla. <clears throat> and we can have more discussions about this at the administrative meeting uh, next week. We'll clarify any questions that come up. Great. All right. So I don't want to shut anybody off, but I'm ready to hear from the uh, petitioners at this time. Um, just give your name and address for the for the record, and then pr please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Jessica Allen. I'm a real estate project manager for Valley Community Development. Um, before I launch into my presentation, I do want to give our executive director an opportunity to um, just briefly talk to the to the board. So I'm going to turn it over to Alexis here briefly. She'll just give a, a few minutes, and then I can launch into my presentation. All right. And Ms. Allen, you live where? I You're live in East Hampton. Great. All right. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Alexis Breitnecker, and I'm the executive director of Valley Community Development, and I live in Cummington, Massachusetts. 
Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for letting us move forward with this project and get to this stage in front of the ZBA. And Valley is really excited about this development. Um, it's our first homeownership project in quite a few years because lining up funding for homeownership is a pretty tricky piece to do. And um, you happen to have a qualified census track in Amherst that lets us be able to even consider this opportunity. So thank you again for taking the time. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jess. Great. Thank you, Alexis. Thanks. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have, I do have a, a 27 slide PowerPoint presentation. So um, I just want to confirm with the board that um, you want me to proceed straight through the presentation. Um, and then you will ask questions at the end. I shouldn't be pausing at any point and looking for feedback. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I think generally that's the case. I think it's best for you to proceed without a lot of interruptions. But sure. if there is something that a board member finds they need to be clarified to understand the point you're making, you know, as opposed to in-depth questioning of your proposal, but just for clarification, sure. I would okay. make sure to ask a question at that point. But Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to launch into the presentation, if I can find it. You see a presentation? Yep, we've got it. Perfect. Um, oops, I jumped in the middle of it. I don't know why. You get a preview. Hi, my name is Jessica Allen. I am a real estate project manager here at Valley CDC. Um, thank you so much for, um, I want to say, meeting, a second meeting a, a month. I know volunteer boards have a lot of responsibility and it's a lot to attend night meetings and not be home with your family. And so I just want to thank you for um, understanding the the importance of this project and that it's a priority for us and I think the town as well and sort of expediting that permitting process by um, coming in an extra week a month. So thank you for that. So this is the Amherst um, Community Homes uh, Project. It's an affordable home ownership development. Um, just to talk about who Valley is, some of you may know we are a nonprofit that was formed in 1988 to serve low and moderate income community members in Hampshire County. Um, we kind of have three pillars here at Valley. We do uh, affordable housing development. Um, we also do first time home buyer assistance and we also have a small business assistance program. So those are our core programs that we do here at Valley. Um, to date, we have either developed or partnered in the development of 391 apartments or homes since our inception in 1988. All of those have been 100% affordable. Um, and our developments range from small to medium size. Um, in Amherst, we have just completed East Gables, which I'm sure you're aware of, which is 28 studio rental apartments. Um, we also have um, 11 family rentals at Valley Main Street that was developed, I believe, in the early 2000s. And then there were eight home ownership um, uh, homes uh, program that was done in the mid 90s. So those are the, the three programs to date um, in Amherst. So just to introduce our development team, I believe most of them are on the call tonight. And if we need to pull them into the meeting, we can certainly do that. Um, but we are the developer. We have been working with Austin Design Cooperative out of Greenfield for, as our architect. Um, this is the same architect that designed East Gables. We have been working with Dodson and Flinker, um, uh, landscape architects for our site design. They're based out of Florence. Uh, we have a civil engineering team from Stonefield Engineering based out of Salem. And we have an attorney um, representing us from Doherty, Wallace, Pilbury, and Murphy out of Springfield. And they are very familiar with 40B and condominium associations, which is why we're working with them. Our work to date. So this is a project that's been in the works since before I even started at Valley about two years ago. Um, my colleague, Laura Baker, had been in discussions and negotiations with the landowner, um, doing some minor due diligence. In 2002, as it started to look like it might be a, a real project, we started to do some site due diligence, including some wetlands investigations, some wetlands delineations. Um, we did a phase one and phase two site assessment with soil investigations. We did soil analysis. Um, so we really took a good hard look to make sure that this was a site that was going to work for us, um, looking at zoning, trying to determine um, how that was going to work, what our permitting process was going to be in this project, and understanding that we knew we wanted to do a home ownership project, 
It was just a matter of how that was conceptually going to play out. Um, we acquired the site in August 2022. Before we even acquired the site, we started to do some community engagement. We um, had a Zoom meeting with the Butters. We had had conversations with some of the um, homeowners at the co-housing right up the street. We had some conversations with the Butters while we were out on the site. So we've had a very robust community engagement process here, and I'll show you some of the details of how much work we've done with that um, as part of this uh, development project. At the same time, in parallel, we were working on development design. So as we were as we were looking at building design, how we're looking at site design, we're going back to the community, we're going back to abutters and saying, does this check out with you? Does this make sense? And so incorporating that feedback in sort of a parallel track. Uh, we were awarded um, CPA money in February um, of this year and received housing trust award money in August of this year. And, um, combined, it's a very generous um, contribution to the project. Um, we've also received a letter of interest from Commonwealth Builders, who is the primary public subsidy for this project. And that letter is in your packet and uh, was provided to us in August. Although we have been in conversations with Commonwealth Builder program staff since 2021. Um, so it's been a long time that they've had this project on their in their pipeline. So program goals. First and foremost, this is an affordable first time home buyer um, project. So all of the homes are to be purchased by first time home buyers. That is first and foremost, the goal of this project. Other goals are to um, increase BIPOC home ownership. Um, Commonwealth Builders is really committed to trying to increase black home ownership. You'll see from this article from November, 2022, just how far off the, the percentages are. Um, I was doing a little research before the meeting and black home ownership has only increased by 0.4%. So less than half a percent in the last 10 years. So most of our equity that we own as households or in our house. So for those individuals that haven't had an opportunity either because of financing, because of zoning, because of land use regulations, to be able to purchase a home has really offset the ability for folks to be able to build assets. And so it really provides them that generational wealth. Um, so this is really looking to increase the home ownership opportunities specifically for BIPOC homeowners um, and households and really try to level the playing field, um, understanding that housing is one of been the biggest con um, contributors to the equity gap. Um, so all of this is kind of realized through how the lottery will be run, and then some of the deed riders that will be tied to these homes. So I'll get into the details of that, but this is the big picture goal for this project. So the Commonwealth Builder Program. So you know, we're gonna hear a lot about this program. This is our major subsidy. It is the only state public subsidy available for home ownership. Um, in 2008, when the housing market crashed, uh, the state started looking at affordable housing and really focusing on the rental market and less focus on the home ownership market. So up until recently, 2021, there has not been any public subsidies available to build um, affordable home ownership um, developments. So this, this came into play in 2021. Um, what it does is it offers a subsidy of $250,000 per home for those homes that are sold to households that are 100% AMI and lower. So um, it is offered to 100, it, you can get subsidies for 120 AMI, but the subsidy amount is much lower. So we have been in conversations with the Commonwealth Builder staffers, like I said, for a number of years. We've been working out the financing numbers with them to see how do we best maximize this program to be able to get what we need in order to build. Um, it is really based on geographic eligibility. Like I noted before, the major um, goal of this program is to increase Black home ownership. So it is only available in a geographic region, it is not available statewide. So the regs keep shifting and changing. They have shifted and changed with the ARPA money. So the program received um, a big chunk of ARPA money. And with that ARPA money came ARPA regulations. And so the Commonwealth Builders Program had to shift a little bit in order to meet the ARPA requirements. So in 2023, 
Commonwealth Builder Funds is only available in the city of Boston, in gateway cities, and or in disproportionately impacted communities, of which there are two, and they are in Eastern Mass. When we first started having conversations with Commonwealth Builders Program in 2021, qualified census tracts were one of the eligible geographic locations for this funding to be put into place. Um, they are no longer eligible under 2023. However, because we've been in such great conversations with Mass Housing and their Commonwealth Builder Program staff for several years, despite the shift in the program guidelines, they're still willing to support this project with Commonwealth Builder funds, even though it's not technically located in a qualified geographic eligibly, eligible location as of their 2023 regulations. Um, so if we were trying to start this project now from fresh, if we you know, were just starting it and trying to get funds, we wouldn't be able to do the project. So we've really been kind of grandfathered in a little bit and um, we're very grateful that Mass Housing and the Commonwealth Builders programs have allowed to, um, us to continue to work on this project. Um, as Alexis noted before, um, there's not a lot of qualified census tracts in Hampshire County. There's only two in all of Hampshire County and they happen to be in the town of Amherst. So this graphic shows where the qualified census tract boundaries are located. There's two of them. It's census tract 8203 and 8205. It kind of excludes UMass. Um, goes down to about here, but this is our proposed development location. So you see that we are smack dab here in the QCT and making this project eligible under Commonwealth Builders. To give you some context on the site, so we are in North Amherst. Um, location from our perspective is fantastic. It has access to a bus route. It's, it's along the PBTA Route 33. And there is an existing PBTA bus stop right here. This is the boundary of the site, the yellow. Um, it's located about a half mile from parks, from other affordable housing projects, from other market rate housing, um, goods and services at the Mill District. It's about 1.5 miles from the UMass campus. So for those that are looking to study um, in terms of like homeowners or um, let's say like a single parent who wants to continue to either, who that wants to work at UMass or continue an education in UMass, this would be an ideal location for them. The site is about nine acres. Um, it's previously developed. It was a, a formerly a trucking and agricultural processing facility. Um, there are three buildings that were located and have now been demolished. This aerial, I, I can't seem to get an up-to-date aerial photos, it's the best I can do. So I just wanted to note that these buildings here are actually now gone. Um, and there is an existing 812 square foot house on the property that is currently rented. So we have a tenant living at that property. Um, we have frontage on two public ways. So we have Pulpit Hill Road frontage and then frontage on Montague Road. Um, there is also a private way, which is Ball Lane and right here onto the back and there's access to the site here. There's also access to the site at this existing driveway. So this is a private way, and then we've got two public ways here. There are existing wetlands that we've had delineated. There is a country ditch here that has turned into a wetland over time. And then we have a riparian corridor back here with, um, with wetlands here. Um, we have public water, access to public water, and access to public sewer. The access to public sewer is off Ball Lane. Um, there is water access off Ball Lane, but there's also water access off Montague Road and Pulpit Hill Road as well. So just some site photos to give some context. So this photograph was taken at the edge of the riparian corridor, looking out. This is the intersection of Montague Road and Pulpit Hill Road. And this is at the intersection looking back um, towards the riparian area. And then this is a couple pictures of the demolished structures. So here's a concrete pad from one of the former industrial buildings. Um, and this is a photograph of the existing house with the tenant in it. So I noted earlier our community process and um, we believe we've done a pretty robust job reaching out to neighbors of Butters and working with the community and, and getting some feedback. So since May 20, um, 2022, before we even acquired the property, we started our, our community process, as I noted. So since that date, we've had eight meetings, either in person or Zoom, 
with neighbors, um, either collectively or individually, um, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with direct abutters to discuss the project. We've met with the municipal, municipal staff four times to do a technical review, kind of throughout different phases of our design development. So we would get to a certain certain um, milestone and we say, okay, you know, we need to talk to the town about stormwater. We need to get some more feedback from the town. So we had a number of, of technical review and I will say that the town staff was very generous with, again, with their time, spending, you know, up to an hour and a half with us at every meeting to sort of walk through our design questions that we had. Um, I've We've met with um, a number of municipal committees. We've presented to the Housing Trust a couple of times. Um, we presented to CPA. Um, we've had on-site meetings with town councilors that have come and had a site visit. Um, I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with councilors as well. So we've we've done that um, five times. And then we've had multiple emails and phone calls from neighbors throughout the process. So somebody that didn't maybe feel comfortable speaking at a public meeting or um, just wanted some more information. I've received a number of phone calls from people who are just interested in purchasing here and wanted to know how do they get an application. Um, so we have a lot of interested parties that are looking to move here, which is great. So I'm just gonna dig in a little bit here. You have um, an architectural building plan set. Um, and so this is just a snippet of one of the floor plans. So just to kind of walk you through some of our design concepts here when it comes to the duplex building. So as I said, 30 homes, 15 duplexes. Um, we very much wanted to make sure that we incorporated um, sustainable development practices and really look to do a passive solar design house and a passive solar design siting of the buildings in the site design. So what that means is that in the summer, um, when the sun is at a certain horizon, the building shields direct sun from coming into the building, keeping the building cooler. In the winter, when the sun is at a lower horizon, it's able to capture that solar gain and heat the house. So we are very cognizant that we have low and moderate income individuals coming into these homes that may not have a ton of money for operational costs, that may not have a lot of money for um, paying uh, condo development fees. So we were really thoughtful on how we wanted to design to make sure that we kept these costs low as possible for future homeowners here. So in this design, when we say passive solar design, if you're looking on the west, you'll see that there's a lot of windows on this side. That's to gain solar heat in the winter. Um, on the north side, we don't have as many windows. Um, and we've got 18 of the, of the homes are two bedroom. 12 of the homes are three bedroom. All of them have 1.5 baths. There are four different building types in this um, in this development, really to make sure that we had varied um, sizes and heights. So none of the buildings are the same height. There are variation of, of height. We wanted to make sure there's a variation of massing to keep it architecturally interesting. Um, and then on the site plans, those are labeled as units A through D. So if you look at the site plan, you'll see an, a, a letter on the certain footprints. That's what that's in reference to. And um, and like I said, it's it's mixing it up to make sure that we get kind of a, an interesting configuration architecturally. Six of the homes are accessible. They're designed to be accessible. They're one story homes with door widths um, and bathroom turning radiuses to accommodate a wheelchair. All of the homes are designed to be visitable. So they are at a flat grade um, at the entry. So anybody in a wheelchair can enter any of the homes. We wanted to make sure that even though these homes have a pretty small footprint, they range somewhere between 995 square feet to about 1200 square feet for the three bedroom. We wanted to make sure that the homes had interior and exterior storage. So you'll see that there's these mud rooms that have been designated that can be used for storage. If you look at the second floor, floor plans, you'll see there's additional storage up there. And then every single one of the duplexes has outdoor exterior storage space that can be accessed here. So the idea is we didn't really want to have um, a bunch of sheds popping up after we left um, and for somebody to have to keep coming before the ZBA in order to put in a shed. So we were hoping to be able to accommodate um, out, uh, exterior storage for each individual homeowner by building it into the design. 
Um, we're planning to do all electric utilities. So um, again, trying to, to keep the um, everything's fossil fuel free. We're not gonna be using any fossil fuels. And then having individual um, PV systems for each unit. Again, intentionally looking at it as an individual system because with this passive solar design, um, not everybody is gonna have sort of equitable access to the sun. So um, rather than trying to deal it, with it as a condominium association with common solar across all units, each unit will have their own individual PV system. We think that will be more fair and equitable for homeowners in the future. Um, so if somebody's running a lot of heat and they have PV that's offsetting it, or somebody is, decides that they don't wanna use a lot of heat, at least it's sort of contained within that one home. Ms. Allen, is PV photovoltaic? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, also looking at 100% affordability. So all of the homes will have some deed restriction. Again, going back to that um, concept of trying to, to shrink the equity gap, the racial equity gap, and trying to create um, uh, assets for a homeowner, the deed restrictions are 30 years. That is part of the Commonwealth Builder Program. That is a requirement of the program. We are looking to have people not be stuck in a, in a situation where they are not going to be able to generate any income off of a sale of a house if they decide to stay there for 30 years. 30 years is about the same length as a mortgage. So really, we really are looking for people to buy these homes, stay in these homes, and then after 30 years, be able to sell get some, um, some generational wealth in their, in their families. All of the um, homes must be owner occupied. There's no rentals allowed. That is, that is built into the deed restriction and part of the Commonwealth Builder requirements. Um, 10 of the homes will be at 80% AI. 20% uh, of the homes will be available to households at 100% AMI. And because we are going through this 40B process, all of the homes will be included on Amherst SHI your subsidized housing inventory. So just a kind of quick look at the different building types. I'd mentioned there's four and you'll see on the site plans, there's a, a letter here that designates what is what. So we've got two building type A's, which is um, one and a half story on the left side, two story on the right side. And we've got a total of two of those in the development. Building type B, we have a two story on the left side, a one and a half story on the right side, and we have seven of those in the development. Building type C, um, we have one and a half story on the left side. We have a one story accessible unit on the right side, and there's a total of three of those in the development. And then building type B, which maintains that accessible one-story unit on the right side of the duplex, but the left side is a two-story, three-bedroom instead of a one-and-a-half-story, two-bedroom, and there's three of those in the development. Um, and if you go into the building plans, you can see renderings and floor plans and details for each of these unit types. As for site design, so we spent a lot of time on site design and received a lot of feedback from the community. Um, the concept really is we wanted to preserve that beautiful meadow in the front that you can see from the intersection of Montague Road and Pulpit Head Road as much as possible and try to concentrate development on areas that had already been developed, already had concrete pads, already has seen some, some level of development in those locations. So that is the sort of big picture um, concept that we were going for was a matter of how is it going to be configured to create a community. We were really looking at pocket park designs as an inspiration. We were looking at co-housing as an inspiration. Um, you know, how can we make these pedestrian friendly? How can we try to intentionally create a community through design? So um, preserving this sort of frontage and reserving a part of it for stormwater infiltration um, and then uh, continuing to have access through the driveway. Um, there would be access here off Pulpit Hill Road with two common parking areas. Um, the rest of this is all pedestrian. So this is a 12 foot pedestrian um, pathway, main spine that kind of connects the development with secondary pathways throughout. 
These secondary pathways help to create some of these quasi-public spaces. So we have areas of common lawn that have been intentionally created and designed within each of these sort of clusters of homes. Um, I think the trickiest part of this whole process was trying to use the passive solar orientation without making it look too cookie cutter. So how do we try to maximize that solar access without having it be too rigid looking? So we spent a lot of time tweaking and that's why we ended up honestly with four bu different building types was because how do we need to be able to, to maximize our solar gain and keep this sort of a very intentionally New England villagey sort of look, a co-housing cottagey look. Um, so this 12 foot pedestrian path would be paved. It has three foot shoulders on each side. That was a request to the fire department. Um, the parking areas have handicapped parking. Uh, actually, I'll get to that in a second. Um, oh no, it's right here. Yeah, so we've got 58 spaces. Three of them are temporary. So these are temporary spaces. And the reason they're temporary is we need that, we need that for the once a week um, trash delivery or trash pickup and recycling pickup. So these spaces can be utilized on non pickup days, but um, need to be left open on days that the trash is collected. Um, we have um, five handicap spaces total. We intend to provide eight uh, electric vehicle spaces. So wired and with um, the infrastructure for EV. Um, and then providing another EV ready. So wiring for it, but not putting in, not installing the actual um, uh, information or the information, the, um, the pedestals. Um, for utilities, we are looking to have electric and telecommunications access coming off of Route 63. Water would be a loop that comes in off 63 and connects through. And then sewer is coming from Ball Lane. Uh, we attempted for a long time to try to completely stay off ball lane for any reason, and I'll explain in a minute. Um, it really has to do with the, the legality of it and the fact that it's a private way. Um, but due to the, the high groundwater in some locations, due to the, the slopes and trying to minimize how much fill we would need to bring in in order to make the stormwater work, at the end of the day, we needed to um, to or make the utilities work. At the end of the day, we needed to bring in a small line of sewer and tie in in this location. And when we get to that utilities and stormwater discussion, our civil team will will really dive into the weeds of that and and how we ended up there. Um. So, how did our design shift and change with public comment? So. As I noted, we had a lot of meetings. We had 17 meetings over the course of a year and a half. Um, where we landed and how things shifted and changed. So one, um, not having any vehicular access through Ball Lane. So we had contemplated using Ball Lane as one of the access points for a while and had some concept designs that, that looked at that. But after conversations with the town, um, after conversations with some of the, the neighbors, uh, we decided to that it wasn't worth it in terms of um, the financial impact that it would have to the project to have any access on Ball Lane. Because it's a private way, we would need to upgrade it to be a public way, which means takings, which means putting in a, um, a um, uh, what's it called? Cul-de-sac at the end. Um, it was just infrastructure that didn't seem to make sense and seemed to be more than what the project needed and more pavement than we really wanted to use. So um, there, and there's some varying opinion of residents on Ball Lane itself on whether they wanted it to be upgraded to a, a public way versus those that did not want it to be upgraded to a public way and liked it the way it was. So at the end of the day, we decided, let's just stay off Ball Lane, um, you know, let's, for legal reasons, let's just really focus on access on the existing driveway. Um, but as part of that, as we heard during the community meetings, is that there were neighbors that wanted to at least have a pedestrian pathway that connected Ball Lane to the development. So we incorporated that pathway as part of our design changes. Um, a lot of discussion revolved around how would people safely get to the PVTA stop from the project um, development. So 
we went back and forth. Should we put in a pathway? Should we not put in a pathway? At the end of the day, what we decided to do is add a sidewalk on the, on the um, eastern side of Montague Road. There's an existing sidewalk on the western side, but in discussions, we determined it probably didn't make the most sense to have a mid-block crosswalk to get people to the western side to then go down and then cross again. So we have incorporated a new sidewalk as part of the project to get people safely to the PBTA bus stop. We had a number of one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, one of the direct abutters, and we've put in um, significant privacy screening for him, including an eight-foot fence and robust landscaping. Um, so that has been part, those were changes that were added to the project over time. One of the other requests were also to site one-story homes that were adjacent to the closest butters on the eastern property line. Rather than have a two-story home, there was concerns that people might be able to see into their backyards from a two-story home. So we intentionally sort of shifted um, the buildings around a little bit and made sure that those at that location, there were one-story homes so that there wasn't any um, concern there. For the main pedestrian way, as we had discussions with the town, we added three foot shoulders for fire trucks. Um, we were also considering putting in removable bollards because it really is intended to be a pedestrian way. We don't want people driving through it. That's not the intent of it or the design for it. So, um, but at the end of the day, the request was not to have removable bollards, instead use multiple curbs and put some robust signage there to make people understand that it's for emergency vehicles only. I was also brought to our attention that the number of uh, uh, electric vehicle spaces that we had initially had in our plans did not meet the stretch code. So we added so, um, wiring so that we'd be able to meet the stretch code requirements for EV vehicles. And then we received another comment about the solar capacity for this project. So we met with PD Squared and they helped us to determine that yes, there is in fact solar capacity for the individual homes. We asked them about was there capacity to put solar over the common parking areas? And they indicated that there really was not. So there'd be more infrastructure than what the grid would be able to handle. So we decided not to explore that because that was something else that was brought up by community members. So we've talked a little bit about zoning exemptions. Um, it sounds like there's some dialogue that is happening at the board level in regards to one of those provisions, but really the reason that we're here is that to allow more than one dwelling on a single lot, to allow 15 duplexes on 30 homes. So across the street, the co-housing is in a different overlay zone that allowed them to do multiple structures on one lot. On our property here, which is outlined in yellow and shows that split zoning, uh, we did not have that ability. And we really wanted to make sure we had concentrated development here on that lower density zoned area and also that farmland conservation because we wanna utilize what's already there and kind of protect that beautiful meadow in the front, which actually encourages a higher density of development. So we're kind of flip-flopping the development design from what the zoning uh, wants us to do. We've also requested waivers for the cluster subdivision requirements because we're not creating a new public way. So in the zoning, if you're doing a residential development in the RLD or in the FC overlay, it wants it to be a cluster subdivision. Well, we don't have a public way, so it doesn't make sense to have it be a cluster subdivision. Um, we're also requesting waivers from the some of the overlay district requirements in the farmland conservation overlay district. Um, we're looking for waivers from the dimensional regulations. Um, another wa waiver request is to um, increase the fence height for this front property line here, which I believe is for under the zoning is four feet. We're looking for an eight foot fence for doubling that. Again, that's been based on conversations with that with the butter and their desire for screening, and we've accommodated that in the plans. Um, other smaller waivers is um, understanding that we're building exterior storage into each home, so no need to require a community bike rack. Um, and then waiving all of the separate approvals that would be needed for special permit site plan review or any other local permits and incorporated into one comprehensive permit decision. So a lot of the waiver requests have to do with trying to package this into one decision. So let me take a breath here, we'll drink water. 
So diving here into home buyer requirements. So the Commonwealth Builder Program, these are the three primary requirements that a prospective homeowner must meet in order to be eligible to purchase one of these homes. First, as I mentioned earlier, they have to be a first time home buyer. There's some definition um, clarity there, but essentially a first time home buyer. They must have assets less than $100,000. And they must be qual. They must be able to income qualify. So, they must be, you know, an eighty percent or one hundred percent AMI homeowner. But they also have to be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage loan. They have to be able to provide a minimum of three percent down payment or be approved for a down payment assistance program. They must be able to pay all closing costs, and they must be able to complete homeownership counseling by the time of purchase. And luckily for us here at Valley, that is a service we provide. So I've been kind of beating the drum at community meetings saying to people or anybody who calls me and says, how do I get one of these, one of these homes? My response has been, you need to make sure that you've got your credit in check and in line and to be able to start saving money because just because you're a first time home buyer, just because you have assets less than $100,000, you'll still need to be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage, which right now is at 7.25% when I looked the other day. So, you know, these are these are these are tough for anybody to meet, but in particular, we're hoping that people are starting now, understanding that we're just beginning this permitting process. It's going to take a little while for us to get into construction, but individuals that are interested in purchasing one of these homes should be talking to Donna Cabana, who's our home ownership counselor, to try to figure out how they can get themselves lined up and in good position to be able to get into one of these homes later on. So the Commonwealth Builders Program as of 2023 has a couple of home buyer preferences. And again, this is these preferences are a result of that influx of the ARPA money that came into the program a couple of years ago. So one, again, fortunate for us, is households living in a qualified census tract. So any household that lives in either one of these two qualified census tracts in Amherst um, would be a preferential home buyer under this program. Um, I looked at the data just to get a sense of what that meant for the town of Amherst. It's 35% of the total town population and 35% of the total land area in Amherst. So a third of Amherst living in the qualified census tract would have a home buyer preference under this program. Um, another preference that could be utilized is households that qualify for certain federal programs. So if there's a program that's um, that qualifies for SNAP or free reduced lunch, um, any of these federal programs, they also would be a home buyer preference and would have a higher preferential in the lottery process. So quickly on anticipated sale prices. So these are not set in stone. The final sale prices are gonna be set by mass, mass housing when we get to the time of marketing, which will be a couple of years from now. And they're going to reflect what those current HUD income limits are and what the market conditions are. So when I've been in discussions with Mass Housing about setting these sale prices, they're looking at, they're taking a pretty conservative approach to determine what the sales price can be based on not just income level, but um, the income of somebody paying no more than 30% of their household income on housing, looking at interest rates, looking at putting down 5% down payment. Um, and so they're really kind of figuring out, like if you take in all those different considerations, that number kind of fluctuates in terms of what somebody's able to buy. So say interest rates either go up in a couple of years, that number shrinks, that, that, that gap kind of shrinks. If interest rates go down, that number would open up a little bit more opportunity for individuals. So it's really based on market conditions. So understanding that as like a, just sort of as a side note here, this is the, these are the numbers that Mass Housing has most recently provided me. So looking at the two bedroom, one story, 80% AMI, $150,000. Um, the two bedroom, 1.5 story, 80% AMI, 163.4. The three bedroom, two story, 80% AMI, at 179.4. So for the 80% AMIs, we're ranging from 150,000 to about 180,000. It's about $30,000 difference. 
For the 100% AMIs, we're ranging from about 190 to 232,000. Um, so lowest lowest price for the one story accessible 80% AMI is 150,000. Highest is 232. This is still way below what's on the market right now in Amherst. And I look at the MLS every day and I do not see anything that of, of this price point in Amherst except for potentially a vacant land every once in a while, maybe a condo. Um, so this is really hitting a price point that people within this income bracket would be able to hit. So as I was explaining earlier about restriction terms, um, 30 year restriction term from initial sale. Again, this program is not looking to put a 99 in perpetuity restriction on it because they're looking to for people to be able to create that intergenerational wealth to create some asset for their family. Um, because we are going through a 40B process here, so the restrictions are gonna be probably a little bit different between the 100% AMI and the 80% AMI. So under the Commonwealth Builders program, typically what they like to see for those moderate income individuals is years one through 15, there's some pretty strict resale and buyer restrictions. It has to be a first time home buyer, so it has to hit certain price points. It's kind of similar to um, the requirements is when they bought in. But after year 15, there's unrestricted sales amounts. You can sell to the buyer market opens up, but you're subject to an equity sharing with public funders. So that would also mean the town of Amherst because you're a public funder, because you've put in CPA money, because you've put in trust money, some of that um, equity sharing would come back to the town. So for the 80% AMI, unfortunately, we don't have this the same sort of dual level. Um, and it's, it's, it's strictly a resale and buyer restrictions for 30 years. Um, and this is again, a result of being permitted under 40B, this creates this restriction. Um, but that being said, you know, this is still a lot less of a, a, a restriction in terms of years than what was typically done prior to 2008 when the market fell. When you had affordable home ownership projects, they were often 99 year restrictions. So this, you know, even now with this sort of um, limited for the 80% AMI, it's still giving that ability for a homeowner in 30 years when their mortgage is paid off to be able to gain some equity in their house. Um, within this 30 year term, again, to try to create this intergenerational wealth, there is buy right transfers to immediate family during the term. It must be owner occupied, but if a parent wants to grant a child the house, they're able to do that. Typically, if you have an affordable home ownership um, or home come up on the market now, I believe it's to the first person who puts in the offer. That's what I've discussed with Donna Cabana. That's typically how it works. For this project, you wouldn't follow those same processes. You could be you could transfer it to an immediate family member. The term has the ability to reset. However, the municipality has to exercise a, a right of first refusal and elect to do so. So as the home comes up for sale, there is a provision that if the town of Amherst wants to reset the term for another 30 years, they would have the ability to do so. So that language gets worked out with mass housing and we are happy to have mass housing um, staff and attorneys talk with your town attorney to figure out what makes the most sense in terms of that language. Um, but that is, a, that is an option for the town. And then all the resales are completed by mass housing. So there's no staff time that would be required for the town of Amherst to assist on any of the, um, the resales. It's all completed by mass housing. So marketing. So um, we follow kind of a similar pattern to uh, the rental process for the rental um, apartments that like we did at, at um, East Gables. We need to create an affordable fair housing marketing plan that would be drafted by us, Valley, and then it gets reviewed and approved by Mass Housing as the primary subsidy provider. Um, mass Housing at the time of marketing will set those maximum sale prices based on the market conditions and based on the income restrictions at the time. We would follow a similar lottery process. Um, there would be a wait list that would be maintained by Mass Housing. Um, and then Mass Housing, would be determined to be the affordability monitoring agent to Valley to make sure that we're in compliance with the marketing plan. 
So as for future governance of the, of the development, so um, per the Commonwealth Builder regulations, it can either be a um, straight fee sale for a single family home, or if it's a condo association, it's required to have a professional management company with that um, condo association. So we intend to draft condo docs that meet the mass general laws. There would be a board of managers. We would have a master deed, bylaws, rules and regulations. Um, Valley has already hired an attorney to assist us on drafting those condo docs. Um, they have expertise in 40D projects. They have expertise in drafting condo docs. And something I actually failed to mention when we were talking about the site plan um, is that every home will have a limited use area associated with it. So we have these common spaces, but then every home has a, um, a, a small square footage um, that is considered their own yard. So how what is maintained or what is maintained and what is regulated within those limited use areas versus the common areas will be different. And those will be all spelled out in the condo docs. So for the common areas, we're looking at the parking areas. We're looking at pathways, um, at the common lawns, the, the um, protected meadow in the front, any common infrastructure, stormwater system. So, you know, ice and snow removal, trash and recycling, uh, landscape mowing, utilities, stormwater maintenance. And as I mentioned earlier, again, we're looking to try to keep these condo fees very reasonable. We don't want to overburden somebody who's already putting all the skin in the game that they can muster to own a home to then cost burden them with outrageous condo fees. So we're really trying to keep the condo fees as reasonable as possible, but not letting the property just go afoul either. So balancing those two things together. And as I mentioned earlier with the homeowners, they would have their limited use, limited use areas that they'd be responsible for. And then the, um, the their, their home itself. So property management, um, I think as part of this application packet, you receive the property management um, document. So we'd be looking to work with the condo association to hire a professional management company. Um, we would certainly assist the condo association on that. Uh, right now we're looking to have trash and recycling completed once a week. We've had many conversations with the local hauler um, about truck radiuses and, and whatnot, and all of that's been incorporated into the site plans. Um, looking to have snow removal and storage per storm event. Um, you'll see on the site plans that there's three areas already identified for snow storage. Um, and we can talk about that at a future meeting and get into the details of that. Um, we've provided a lighting plan, a photovoltaic plan. Um, we're looking to have that lighting mostly just be in the common parking areas and then smaller bollard um, lighting along the pathways. Um, really trying to keep it dark um, as, as light as possible, limited as possible in terms of light, but also trying to make it safe. So trying to find that balance between the two. Um, Landscape maintenance, looking at the mowing of common areas, seasonal cleanup, stormwater systems need to be cleaned twice a year, and you'll find all of the operation and maintenance um, information in the stormwater plan. Um, we are also proposing to have a mailbox shed, two of them actually, on the site plans near the parking areas. And in these um, sheds, we look to have common mailboxes, a community bulletin board where people could post information for the rest of the community, and then storage for utility carts, because if you're unable to uh, drive your groceries to your front door, we want to have a, a way for people to be able to bring them. So having a storage area for some um, common use utility carts. So this is, again, mentioned in the application, but just hitting on some of the highlights that have been noted in community plans and how this project meets those needs. Um, in the 2015 housing market study, there is a note about providing small two and three bedroom college style units at a higher density than traditional single family housing. In the housing production plan of 2013, encouraging, the, encouraging private development of cottage or bungalow style cluster developments, incorporating universal design and visibility standards, using sustainable development principles, using high energy efficiency for reduced operating costs, and communication with neighboring properties during development process, all of these that we've hit in this proposed development. In the master plan and the housing chapter, it talks about encouraging a greater mix of housing types, sizes, and prices, 
It talks about encouraging development of economically diverse neighborhoods. It's a, it talks about uh, supporting development of affordable units with equity building provisions, developing housing in an environmentally sound manner, and encouraging the, vis the visitability of units. So timeline here. So as I noted, we in 2022, 2023, focusing on acquisition, community engagement, site and building design, local funding requests, and here we are at local permitting. Um, once we get through permitting, then we would start working on our final construction documents. We would go out to bid with the general contractor and figure out what that pricing is. Um, we would still continue to look for grants and foundations to support the project. And then we would be putting in an application to an official application to come with builders. Um, once funded, we'd start closing for financing, start construction, marketing, lottery, construction completion, and sales to selected buyers sometime between late 2025, um, 2026. So it takes a long time to do these, these deals. You've heard that before with affordable housing. It, it, it's never something that's quick. It, it takes time. And that's the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions of the board at this time. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, that was really insightful. I appreciate it. Um, what I'd like to do is just turn a little bit to the, the sort of the, the home buyer preference slide that you put up. And I'd like to understand a little bit about the income restrictions as well as the uh, sales restrictions and what I would it, probably inaccurately term a limited equity model. But um, look, can we go back to that? And so the anticipated uh, sales prices, is that? Yep, that, that's a good place to start. Okay. I'm going to do it in uh, in a PDF and see if this um rather than the PowerPoint itself does that work? Do you see this? Sure do. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Great. So Great. The first question I have is understanding that this is going to change, in, but by the time it goes out to uh, to actually for people to uh, purchase these homes, but mm -hmm. as of today, what are we looking at for an income required for the first? unit here, the two bedroom, one story, 80% of area median income at $150,000. Mm -hmm. For that night, for that just shy of 1,000 foot square foot home, mm -hmm. what is going to be required to, to do that? Um, so, I believe it's in the project narrative and let me just pull it up so I can confirm. Let me just move it or hold on, I'm going to stop for a second. Just pull it over here so I can see what I'm doing. Um, I want to say that it's starting at 62 and going to 90. So for those, the, for the 80% bucket of houses, it would be yep. 60 to $90,000 of income required to make the down yeah. payments, make the monthly payment and include the condo fees. Yeah, and it's, it, depends on the fam it depends on the family size. So there's all, right. you know, under HUD, that's the one through the eight families. And so it's going to depend on how many members are in the household. Um, and really, it's going to depend on how much money, like if somebody's able to bank $50,000, or if they're able to come to the town and go for down payment assistance through your CDBG or CPA, or potentially reparations committee, as that's being discussed in the town. Um, you know, if they're able to bring that number down, then they are not even paying $150,000. They're going to be paying less than that in a mortgage. And that makes a difference mm -hmm. in terms of what their mortgage payment can be. So, and how much they're willing to, to be able to, but I can get back to you on the, on the exact numbers as of now, I would want to go back and look in the mass housings worksheet and the numbers that they've pulled up. So I'll make a note of that and I will follow up with the, with the exact numbers for you. And would you do that for all the difference? 80 and 100 percent. Absolutely. I'll do it for uh, I'll show you what the um, the calculations were that mass housing developed for each of the um, AMIs. I'm happy to share that information. And you're using the current interest rate for mortgages, which is about, about you said seven and a half percent now. That was as of last week when I, yeah. I um, mass the housing. Changes, I know. Yeah. Mass housing. Uh, the last time they updated these numbers was, I think, be right before I submitted the application. So things could have changed in the past month, but I can give you, um, I'll tell you what date these numbers are as of and how they've, um, and how they figured it out. I'm happy to it do that. Me, it gives me a ballpark to try to understand this better. And I know it, with sure. all the qualifications that I know it's going to change over time. Yep. The second thing is 
talk to me a little bit about the sort of the uh, res sales restrictions and then the uh, the um, recapture of equity because you're trying to balance two things. You're trying to provide the ability for people to build up some equity and some wealth in a house, which which mm -hmm. is difficult to, for a large swath of society to do. Mm -hmm. I understand, but at the same time, you're trying to preserve this as housing stock that's affordable for low 80 to 100 percent of median income families. And those are two kind of competing or conflicting goals. There's tension, if nothing else, between those two goals. Mm -hmm. so part of that is recapture. Part of that is limiting who you can sell it to. Let's go through that again for just run through it with me again. How sure. you that and where those limitations are. Sure. So um, in terms of the right of first refusal part, that was actually added later on. It was not in the original Commonwealth Builders regulations in 2021. It was something that was added later on because a lot of municipalities asked for it. So the initial intent of the program was really to create that equity um, uh, sharing ability, not sharing ability, but be able to for a household to build equity in their home. That was the goal. But there was too much question and pushback from municipalities and saying we want to have be able to have some control to be able to reset that if needed. So that's why I think it might be it would be useful to have the mass housing attorneys or their staff sit down with town officials and sort of hash out what works best for the municipality. They have already offered to do that because I think each municipality has a little bit different of a flavor of how they want it to work. Um, so whether it's it comes up for sale at mass housing, they notify the town saying you have a right of first refusal. If you want to reset the 30 year provision starting on this house, then you can certainly do that and it would be set for the next 30 years. Or if it's somebody who's maybe selling in that 16th year, if it's 100% AMI um, home and they're selling it um, in that 16th year and there's an equity provision, it's going to be, it, it's in the deed restrictions. And I can certainly give you the examples. I can give you copies of the examples that are provided to me. There's a calculation on, on who gets what and how much. And Commonwealth Builders is putting in $8 million plus. The municipality is put in million dollars. So a little bit more than that. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be based on sort of what that contribution already is. And so go, back, go back to your, I think was the PowerPoint page after the one you just showed yep. that, that outlined those restrictions a little bit. Walk me through those again. Sure. Uh, you just did it, but it's, it's easier. Yeah. This is easier to, to Okay. Understand. So, so you we'll, have, so you got, you see it, the 30 yep. year restriction. Okay. So we have a 30 year restriction term. So yep. what makes this complicated is because we're permitting under 40B, the 80% units have to meet the 40B regulations. Um, so um, that has to be restricted for the full 30 years with the resale and buyer restrictions. For those projects that are 100% AMI households, yep. um, those really need to stick with the Commonwealth Builder regulations. They are not willing to allow all units to be just 30 year restriction. I've had this discussion with them because I said to them, seems a little weird that those that are lower income are going to be held to this longer restriction <laughs> with more, there are, you know, their hands tied a little bit longer versus though that might be more moderate income and have this ability to, um, right. you know, so it's, it's a little weird. Mm -hmm. Um, and their response was, well, we're going to hold hard and fast on that 100%. We don't have much leeway with the 80%. Um, and their response was, let me put it to you this way. We're allowing this project to continue in a qualified census tract that doesn't actually isn't an eligible geographic location anymore. So this is kind of like the, um, the price the, you pay for that. What's that? It's kind of the price that the project pays for being allowed to go forward in a, in a what would otherwise be an un, um, uh, a non permitted area. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so that means that for, for the hundred percent years, one through 15, it has to be sold to the same kind of, same kind of restrictions, same kind of income levels as they bought it. Now those will change over time, but the same percentage restrictions. Yep. And, and 15, it has to be a first time home buyer. Has to be a first time home buyer. Okay. Yep. yep. And 15 through 30, um, you you can sell it to other people, but that is when the equity sharing with the state as well as the town comes in, and they Correct. can 
town can decide whether it wants to share to, to grab some of that money or not. The state right. and the want to do it so it can recycle the money. Okay, I understand. And then years one through for the eighty one to thirty, you have the same uh, buyer restrictions as you did originally. You do. After yep. thirty, if somebody holds on to it for thirty years, arguably they bought the house. Correct. They, they own it outright. Correct. They can sell it for whatever price they wish and whoever they wish. Correct. Unless the unless the town sets or, or exercises the right of first refusal. Right. Okay. That's yeah. Thank you. Okay. Lastly, in order, in order to, to create sort of family wealth, allowing by right transfers to immediate family members, mm -hmm. that, that is another way in which we we seek to create some kind of some generational wealth. wealth. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. Got it. Okay. That's Good. very helpful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, that's my first set of questions. I want to open it up for other people on the board. I, Mr. Henry had his hand up first. Um, go ahead, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to piggyback off some of your questions um, for Valley, with the right of first refusal, does that give the town permission to say, we want to buy this property and we want to maintain it as low income? I don't think so. We. Uh... Um, we can, again, I can check with mass housing and I think it's worth having a conversation with direct with them directly, because as they've indicated to me, it can kind of be framed on what the community wants and they desire for this piece. But my sense is that, um, I don't know if the town wants to own it themselves. And I don't, I think the whole idea is that you set the, the right of first refusal again for the next buyer so that they have to now adhere to the deed restriction itself. It would be restricted as affordable. It would continue to have the, the same restrictions as the initial buyer. It would just be kind of re, that 30 year clock would reset again with the new buyer. Does that, am I making myself clear? Did well, I answer your question? You, you did. Okay. And stay, staying with the same line of questions, so in, in years 16 to 30, if the restrictions are lifted, isn't there a concern that if, I mean, people realize, okay, my house now has some equity, I can sell and get something maybe perhaps bigger. Um, isn't there a concern that somebody who has money can buy these properties and then after a while, it is no longer affordable housing, it's just people with money just buying all these properties. How do we safeguard against that? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think, again, it would be have to be sort of tied into that right of first refusal language or something that's tied into the deeds. If if you, I mean, again, the whole idea is for somebody to be able to gain some generational wealth. So 30 years from now, this might not, this would no longer be an affordable housing development, potentially. I think that is a true statement. Um, if all of the buyers stayed in place for 30 years and waited for the restriction to lift, and then decided to sell, they'd be able to make a profit as of anybody else who was a market rate buyer who buys a house and stays in their house for 30 years and pays off their mortgage and then sells their house for, for equity. So um, again, unless the town wants to elect to utilize their uh, right of first refusal anytime a home comes up for sale, and then they can reset that clock for another 30 years of a deed restriction. So that would be up to the town to do that and make that decision every time a home comes up for sale. Okay. The the income requirement, is that is that income per family? What if there's an individual um, person trying to buy this? What is that income requirement? So again, I can I'll send you the I'll send the board the the numbers that were been provided by Mass Housing and how those calculations came out. Um, but if somebody I think it actually might be very difficult for somebody who's a single, just a single person at these income levels to be able to be, um, have enough money for down payment, closing costs, be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage. I think it's going to be tough, honestly. I think if you look at the numbers as of today, you're looking probably at two person households and higher that are able to afford. Again, it could be, it could depend on the individual. If the individual has $75,000 set aside, squirreled away for a down payment that they can put on top of that $150,000 um, uh, sales price, they've just cut that price in half and they might be able to make those, those monthly payments. So it really is, is kind of individual in terms of um, 
on on the individual situation in terms of the purchase. Um, if you've got a if you have a huge amount of money that you can set aside for down payment, that really brings the housing cost down for somebody. And what and what mass housing is really looking at is they want to make sure that you're not paying thirty percent more than thirty percent of your household income monthly income. So they're looking at all those different factors, the interest rates, your down payment. How does that all factor into what that bottom line number is for you as an individual purchaser? Can you make your monthly payment on, in this sort of window, this income window, with all of those other factors taken into consideration? D does that, am I making myself clear? Is that, that is your question? I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Um, which leads me to my other point and question. Mm -hmm. and, and and I will say this for any BIPOC person that's watching, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I, I'm very concerned about people having to be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage because <clears throat> um, BIPOC people, um, the average person doesn't have $50,000, $7,000 saved for a down payment on a house. Mm -hmm. That is quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, more often than not, there are credit restrictions to fixed rate mortgage that a lot of BIPOC people will be challenged to meet their requirements. Mm -hmm. They do have debt. That's why they have very low income because they're not making sufficient money. Mm -hmm. So to be able to, so the requirement to be able to qualify for a fixed rate mortgage loan, I'm concerned that we're going to be excluding a significant amount of people that this project is meant to help. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that concern. Mm -hmm. And the second thing with that is, um, I understand that there's credit counseling, which I actually welcome um, and would like to see what that entails. Mm -hmm. But are we working with any banks? Have Valley discussed this with any banks to say, you know, here is a project. It is meant to help low income people understanding that there are going to be some credit challenges, mm -hmm. but they have stable employment. Mm -hmm. How do you work with them to make sure that they can afford this property? Mm -hmm. And again, if, a, if the average person applies for a mortgage, mm -hmm. the credit score, they're not going to have a credit score right. for a traditional mortgage. Right, right. So I, the, again, another excellent point that you make. Um, to answer the first question in terms of the amount of money somebody might have for down payment assistant, um, again, I'll sort of harp on uh, CDBG funds that are available at the town of Amherst, CPA money that's available at the town of Amherst. Alexis, please jump in if you want to tell me what those amounts are in terms sure. of what's available um, per homeowner. Is it $25,000 per homeowner for CPA? Yep. yep. So Valley currently um, works with a number of municip municipalities to do um, mortgage down payment assistance. Amherst is one of them, and we're funded through CPA to provide up to $25,000 of mortgage assistance um, to low-income buyers to purchase a home in Amherst. Um, that has been true for a number of years. And quite honestly, we've had a hard time using it because there's almost nothing affordable for our first time home buyers in Amherst. Um, that's part of the reason that we're so excited about this development because we're hoping that it actually gives first time home buyers a place to buy in Amherst. Thank you. Um, and then sort of going back to um, also mentioning the reparations committee. I mean, on Monday night, the, the report went to the finance committee I saw in the paper. Um, I've had conversations with certain members of that committee about first-time homebuyer down payment assistance being like a real key um, component um, that, or something that could really be utilized at this project, given the goals that we're trying to, to utilize. So that's another, um, another uh, aspect. In terms of the banks, I think that's a great point. We haven't got to that part yet in this project, but I certainly will try to make a note of that. And um, I think that's that will be part of our next step as we start once we get through permitting and we really start having a real project that we can we can have conversations with. I think that's a great point. Um, if you have if you know of any banks that have programs that we should be talking to, I welcome that information. So please send that my way. Um, yes. um, can I just sorry, can I just sure, go ahead? Um, I do want to um, note that our Valley as an organization and particularly our um, current uh, homeownership manager has a 20 year record of helping first time home buyers and has um, a really good working relationship with a number of local banks. Um, we as an organization also have a good um, uh, relationship with a number of local banks and she has been able to facilitate um, mortgages with a number of first time home buyers um, 
because they, you know, it's just a, it's two decades worth of working together and trying to get people into homes. Um, so while I don't, I can't say like, you know, these three banks are absolutely going to do it. I will say that on a case by case basis, we've been able to move people forward. And um, in terms of the credit worthiness, again, I hear you and I, um, I think I'd go back to harping to what we've been talking about at community meetings and again, trying to get people financially ready now, knowing these homes won't be available for two years and what can folks do now to sort of clean up their credit score so that they can be um, financially ready and credit worthy in order to qualify. Um, these are requirements under the Commonwealth Builder program. So we don't have a lot of flexibility in changing these requirements in terms of the credit worthiness. Um, so again, I think between our relationships with the banks, as Alexis noted, and if you do know of anybody that is interested, please send them our way to talk to Donna. Donna loves nothing more than sitting down and helping somebody figure it out. It's like her favorite thing to do. <laughs> so really, you know, send her, send them to Donna and she would assist somebody to try to get lined up now. You're not going to get a great credit score in a month when all of a sudden these houses come online. You really need to be thinking about it now and understanding that this is what you need to do over the next couple of years to get yourself in a position um, that you're ready to go when the lottery opens up. So in, in, in that sense, would it be fair to say that um, there is significant interest from BIPOC community for this um, that they can actually start now working with credit counseling to your points to be ready in two or three years. Absolutely. We're waiting for the doors to start banging. We, and I keep sending out information and we we've gotten, I don't know if anybody's reached out to Donna directly, but I have had by yes. how they we have, have. Okay. we have at least three folks right now already. Okay, working great. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, my, my other question um, is given that this is low income and, I think I heard something about um, solar issues or not using or not doing solar, but the properties themselves are going to be all electric. Um, no. So we're going to do solar on each of the homes. It was okay. there was requests from some of the community members to try to incorporate um, solar on the common parking areas and try to do like covered parking with solar. Um, and based on you know, incorporating the homes and what they're going to be, what their systems are, and then looking at the, what the systems needed to be for the common um, parking areas are kind of two different levels of system. And there, it, it just didn't make sense to do it for the common parking areas. So I kind of wanted to just nip that in the bud because it came up a couple of times at our community meetings that people wanted solar on the parking areas, but it's just not, it's not feasible given my conversations with PD squared, but on the units, yes, that is our intent. As long as, as long as we have enough money to, to install them, that is the plan. Um, they'll certainly be wired for it. Our hope is that construction pricing isn't so crazy that we'll be able to afford it at the end of the day. And we're also exploring options with um, Representative Dom to try to figure out a state funding source to be able to do solar, rooftop solar for all of the units. Okay. Um Thanks for that clarification. Um, the the other um, question is, um, can transfer to family? Um, how do you envision that working? Because if, um, say, if, if I'm one of these buyers and I'm the owner of this property, I have a mortgage interest, which means I have a financial responsibility to the bank. Mm -hmm. I cannot just transfer it to family. The bank mm -hmm. has to sign off on it because, I mm -hmm. again, I owe the bank money. This mm -hmm. person who's getting the transfer needs to be able to qualify based on the bank's requirements. Sure. So how sure. do you envision that working? So I think really what this, um, under the restriction term, what this um, kind of gets rid of is if right now, if there's an affordable home that goes up for sale, it's kind of a first come first serve so if you can if you can show that you can purchase this home, it goes to that individual. In this case, we wouldn't have to go through that process. The first person that it could be offered to is a family member. But yes, I can look into it. But my understanding is they would still need to be able to pay the mortgage and they still need to be financially viable to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, again, I can ask Mass Housing for more information about how that process has worked. Um, and I'd be happy to get that to you. Okay. Um, and this may be um, a small 
thing compared to the larger thing. But I, I heard about community. I didn't even think about laundry. Are there, is there a plan for any unit laundry, community laundry? Um, laundry is in each of the, in the homes. They okay. each have their own individual laundry. Okay. And then in terms of the bus, mm -hmm. I heard about a sidewalk getting to the bus. Um, is there no ability to say have the bus stop somewhere closer to the property than having, you know, because again, that area at night is dark. Um, sure. That's that's a very, that's a safe issue. Sure. Yeah, I did um, talk to the regional bus coordinator for PVTA and asked him if he'd be willing to put a bus stop right at the end of the parking area off of Pulpit Hill Road. And their answer was there's two bus stops that are too close to that to add a third one. So there's one up at the at the um, co-housing development. And then there's another one at the intersection. They were not willing to put a new one on Pulpit Hill Road um, right at the at the end of the driveway. So I did ask um, and was denied that request. So, um, you know, we talked about putting a pathway through the meadow, but then it was like, you know, then they're going to have to mow the meadow and who's going to do that and what happens if they don't mow it. So what we determined is that just the easiest thing to do would to be put a sidewalk. And let me just share my screen. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to see it well, but we can try. Um, let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. All these Zoom things are in the way. <laughs> Can't see my screen. There we go. So the sidewalk comes here and then connects here and follows the edge of the of the property to here. So that's where the would end. Um, so that is that is where we ended up at the end of the day um, in terms of. Um, the best the best way to deal with the pedestrian access to that location. And I'll make a last point before um, I stop. Sure. If, if we're going the sidewalk option, I would ask that we put in those lights at the sidewalk that people can clearly push the buttons to indicate someone's crossing like we have downtown. Because again, um, in winter, that's going to be very dark where that is. Great. Um, I just want to keep on the financing for a second, then I'm going to go to, you're done, right, Mr. Henry? I, I am, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, then I'm going to go to Ms. Greenbaum. I just want to follow up so we don't lose the thought on this. So the income requirements are only at time of purchase. If somebody is um, fortunate enough to have an increase in their wage that they go above 80% or 100% of whatever is applicable, they still re may remain in that housing, correct? Correct. That's one thing. Secondly, if you do get down payment assistance mm -hmm. um, to, to do this, the 20, 20 or $25,000, is that repayable or is that a grant? It depends on the source that it's coming from, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> right, Nike, do you can you answer that question? I was going to. Sorry, I have a child maybe coming in, so I apologize if there's That's, noise in the background. Um, don't apologize for that. That's all right. <laughs> He's very loud, so <laughs> um, uh, I I don't I can look. So it depends. Um, as I mentioned, we have this program program in Amherst, East Hampton, and Northampton, and each municipality has a slightly different twist. Some of them are repayable, some of them are grants, and I quite honestly can't remember off the top of my head what yeah. Amherst is. Um, but we can certainly respond to you. Um, there is also depending on the municipality, then a lien against the property, particularly if it's a repayable instead of a grant. Um, so we can give you more specific. There's different ways that towns approach it in different ways. And different towns programs approach it. approach it in different ways. And there's different programs too. There's could be statewide programs. Um, and, you know, again, I'm going to talk about reparations. You know, they haven't determined how that would, that could be a, a gift. That could just be a grant with no repayment at all. So, um, you know, it depends on how the program wants to structure itself. And one last question on financing, and then I'll, we'll go to Ms. Greenbaum. So um, you're looking for banks that would qualify that would be interested in this. It seems to me that this would be a classic thing that would give them credit for their Community Reinvestment Act um, scores. Is it not? And is, is that have they found that that is? Have you found that banks find a positive um, effect from their participation in these programs that will help them in their CRA scores? 
Yeah, I, I, I would see that that would absolutely be the case. I mean, remember, though, that the CRA goes on a cycle. So depending on where it hits on the cycle and if they've already hit their CA, CRA credits for the year, they may have a, a, a different opinion. Um, but yeah, I definitely but if we get if we get to them ahead of time so that they know mm -hmm. their cycle is two years from yeah, now. Sure. Yeah, it could be really helpful. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're you're muted. Um, and I'm, I've got a long list of questions too, and I'm very conscious that other people are there, so I'll try stick to my biggest ones and make it quick. Um, thank you for explaining about the 30 year restrictions, but I'm confused how that fits in with the master deed as after 30 years, it may head to fewer people that qualify under the affordable guidelines what if as things change as they do in 30 years and the newer homeowners want to or the new management committee or whatever of, of, of the condo association want to add more units how does that fit in with whatever is in the master deed so the is master deed or is that confused um, I think I can answer it. So the master deed is going to be tied to what is permitted under this project. If the homeowners decide that they want to do something different, they're going to need to come back to the ZBA under a 40B and request changes to the existing permit. Um, I personally don't think that there's probably the ability, are you talking about like subdividing off of uh, Pulpit Hill Road in that meadow? Is that what you're, what you're sort of referring to? It's a nine acre site. Sure. So, so it, it may be nine, it may be eight, it may be eight and a half. I read all three in there, whatever it is. That's not important at this point. Um, you've got 30 units now and times change and we need really dense housing and they want to sure. add six units or ten, whatever sure. in, the, in, the, in the plan that you guys approve, mm -hmm. or we approve actually. Mm -hmm. Now, can they come back in 30 years? as um, you don't know what the law will be either, but the way you're structuring it now, can they come back in in 30 years and add more units if needed? Or are they still under your control after 30 years? We're, we're not gonna be in any control of this. Um, we It is once the home buyers purchase, they are going to be, they're gonna make up the board of managers for the condo association. So this is different from any other- ballot That's project. what I'm asking, it is different. Yeah, it's absolutely different. So we will help assist in setting up the condo association. We will assist in, try, in, in finding a property management company to assist the condo association. But once all the units are sold, Valley is no longer a, a management entity here. The management turns over to the homeowners as the purchasers of the property. Um, so if in five years they decide that they wanna build a community house, they're gonna have to come back to the ZBA and get an approval for that and modify um, their permit. In terms of extra more units, I would say that the land would have to be able to accommodate that. And we had a really challenging time to make the stormwater work with the number of units that we had. So any more impervious surface that's added to here, whether it's driveways, whether it's houses, the stormwater and the land need to be able to accommodate for that. And I'm not sure if it has the ability to do that. So um, so that would be my my comment on, on additional units. Looks like yeah. Rob. Rob, do you have a, a state, something that'll apply yeah. to Ms. Greenbaum's question. Yep. So uh, Ms. Greenbaum does bring up some some um, good concern. Well, concerns that are legitimate about this permit. So I just want to reiterate that, you know, as we move on through this public hearing process, um, we're anticipating at least four more hearings that cover different topic areas. And one of the topic areas will be property management, which includes the the condo association, which will include how you know uh, ownership will go from Valley to this. Um, condo association, how they're going to find their property management company that's going to um, facilitate, um, you know, any road repair or uh, repair to the access way or, and maintaining the landscape and stuff like that. So I just wanted to keep that in mind too, Hilda, in case, you know, you wanted to ask any further questions about that, or if you want to wait until that hearing, but totally up to you. No, I, I wasn't bringing up that at all. 
I okay. was more, more concerned about how the mouse to be the continuing affordability was going to work. And the other thing is about the stormwater plan now, we know can change rapidly in two years as the whole weather system has changed very rapidly in a very few years. And, and some of these houses could be underwater, who knows? But, but that's the same. My other big question that I don't, it's been an issue of mine over the years is the whole issue of using the census tract to determine who can live in these units. I'm, I'm one for always questioning the local preference so does the way these units are being picked from two census tract means that we can have 100% local preference? Well, let's put it this way, that the program has a preference for anybody living in a qualified census tract. And Amherst certainly isn't the only qualified census tract in, in the Pioneer Valley region. So if uh, somebody lives in a different qualified census tract in a different community, they would also be given um, a preference but it's not the whole commonwealth which does cut the population down a little bit well if somebody wanted to relocate from a different qualified census tract on the eastern part of the state they could potentially be uh, in that preference category well then can can we have something like a 70 percent no, uh, that's not part of this program it's a 40b project so the board has the ability to set that standard i would encourage the board to think about how this project is is carefully cited already in a geographic location that gives priority preference to households um so i'll leave it to the board to decide well will somebody explain that farther down the line explain what uh, the whole uh, the local preference versus the qualified whatever from over the state. So the ZBA has the ability to set local preference with any 40B um, permit, and they can set it no more than 70%. So um, that has that was enacted during the East Gables um, project. Um, Valley has had some robust, robust discussions about local preference and how it, depending on a community, can... Um, enforce the inability for those who are people of color to get into a unit because it's if it's a if it's a majority white community and it's a local preference then you're going to have majority white um uh, applicants so you know i think for this project given its goals and given that it's already located in a qualified census tract i don't believe there's a need to set local preference but i'm not the decision maker the zba is so the zba as a board will need to have that discussion and determination on what makes sense for this project but it would not be something i think valley would advocate for we think that we have where we have the ability to pull from the community already under uh, being located in a qualified census tract i have one, one last question you originally had 120% uh, area mm -hmm. median, uh, at median income and most of the need or a huge part of the need in the town is for workforce housing people who live who work here can't afford to live here sure. and 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 so i'm curious why did you or were you forced to delete the 120 percent category um good question so under the commonwealth builders um, program the subsidy that they provide for 120% AMI is only $150,000 per unit with construction costs close to $500 a square foot. We could not have we could not find enough money under Commonwealth Builders to be able to provide that. We also had market rate at the beginning of this project, um, you know, yeah. a, a year and a half ago, we started out with a, a project that was 80, 100, and, and 120 in market rate. I can't remember now, it was so long ago, but we had market rate units. Our market study came back and said, you can't sell these houses at the price that it costs to construct them. The market, even though the market is so high in Amherst, the construction pricing is so out of control. I know. But the numbers <laughs> don't work. So, so sitting down with the Commonwealth Builder staff, they helped us figure out what's the best mix of 80% AMI and 100% AMI 
to maximize the amount of subsidy that we can receive from Commonwealth builders. So really some of these decisions are a financing decision on our part on how to be able to fund the project. We wouldn't be able to fund the project or receive enough subsidy um, if we kept the 120 AMI in the project. Hmm. May I just follow up on a question from Ms. Greenbaum um, yes. with, with a census tract? Um, am I hearing correctly that, actually, let me just, just use Springfield as a preference. If someone from Springfield qualifies, they could actually relocate to Amherst and be qualified for this one of these houses? Correct. Okay, that is concerning to me. And um, going back to um, the Homeowners Association, um, I, I lived in a community that had an HOA and those fees um, increased significantly over time. Mm -hmm. And how, what is, what is the measure, what's in place here? I mean, this is a low income property. Um, what is the development going to do to make sure that whatever um, management company develops this HOA understands that this is a low income property and as such that expectations are there that this is not going to be your standard HOA with those kind of costs. Sure. So I think that will all come down to when we're drafting the condo docs, um, which will definitely be part of our discussion, I believe, later on in this hearing process. Um, we've hired an attorney. We've had some initial discussions about what's incorporated in those condo fees. Uh, we're 100% with you on that. We do not want these fees to, to, to creep up over time. We understand that these are low, moderate income households that probably don't have a lot of extra money to pay um, a, um, a condo association fee on top of their mortgage payment, on top of their food, on top of all the other things that it takes to survive these days. So, um, so we have designed this project in such a way to try to minimize the amount of maintenance that's going to be needed. And you'll hear about that a little bit more as we get through the process, you know, picking no mow grass that only needs to get mowed twice a year, um, other things like that to, to really try to keep the maintenance as low as possible and putting the responsibility in the home owners themselves in terms of those limited use areas, they are responsible for maintaining those areas. The condo association would not. So the condo association really is dealing with plowing, um, you know, snow ice removal, making sure the pathways are safe to walk on, um, minimal landscaping to the, to the best that we can under the common areas. Um, you know, we've been really thoughtful about that as we've gone through this design process, bring it up again and again and again. Well, what if we added this? Well, how much is that going to take to maintain? Because we don't want to be adding things here in this development that's going to take a lot of money to maintain. So it has really been at the forefront of our design process. And I think we can get into that a little bit more in terms of the document itself and what we can put into those documents. I think that's a conversation that we can have with our attorney team to see how do we craft language within the master deed to and, and try to keep that information um, or to keep those costs down as much as possible. It truly is a goal of ours. And that would go ahead. I'm just trying to go ahead and follow up if you want to. Uh, not a follow-up. I, I, it's a it's a different question. So if you have a follow-up, you can go ahead. I do. Uh, just real quickly on that. Number one, I think that'll be that that's a whole series of issues that we're going to have a, uh, an additional time to spend some time on in another meeting. And but these are good identifiable questions. But when it really comes down to it, once you once you've sold off all these homes, the homeowner association is going to be made up of ho the homeowners. It's not going to be run by a run by the uh, the, the contractor. So they will have the ability to make a decision as to what they can afford, how much they want the rents to go up, unless there's restrictions within the deed that require them to take care of certain things. But they'll be able to control those costs to some extent themselves, correct? Correct. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Henry. So in the application, I believe I read that there's an anticipated nine kids um, within this community. Um, is there anything in the development for kids, a playground, a park. Um, I think the closest park in Mill Valley, um, Mill River is not is not very close to this. And most of these people who expect to live there may not have transportation. Mm -hmm. So what is on site for kids? Uh, another good question. So um, again, we sort of intentionally left areas unprogrammed because we think it's important for the people who end up buying in this development to have some 
say and some control of how they want common spaces to be utilized. So we have multiple common lawns. Any of those can have a play structure on them at some point. They can certainly put up a basketball net in the parking lot. Um, we did add a water spigot for a community garden. We're not going to build the community garden because we don't know whether the residents here are actually going to want a community garden. Not everybody wants to have that. Maybe they'll just do it in their limited use area. But we did put in the infrastructure in a very specific location in case that is something that the residents wanted. So, um, you know, this, we really are designing this with the intention of it having a be a community. So our hope is that these homeowners really gel together as a community and make decisions together about what makes sense for, um, for their spaces and for those common spaces and what they'd like to put where. And with that understanding, is there a commitment from the development company to say, we won't put anything in there, but we'll leave some money so you guys can decide and you can you have some money. So if you want a playground, you can put a playground. If it's a basketball court, you can put a basketball court in there. Can you guys make that commitment? I can't make that financial commitment now, but what I can do is we have money set aside for contingency. That is money that is used in case there's some unforeseen condition that we need to deal with. Um, we have a pretty robust contingency set aside. If you look at the pro forma, you'll see what that number is. Um, if there's money left over at the end of the day, that's kind of what we use contingency money for is those little extras that we weren't sure whether we were going to have money for in the beginning. But if it's something that we think makes sense, um, we can certainly think about how to how to do that for the residents. If that again, if that's something they're desired, it could be that no children live here. So does it make sense to build a playground when no kids end up there? Um, I don't think anybody wants to utilize money and not have something be used. So um you know, I think it's something for us to think about, but once we get closer to the end on see how much money we actually have left over um, out of our contingency budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from board members. Um, we're, we will have some public comment. We'll have time for public comment, Max. With the number of attendees, I expect we'd have some robust public comment on this, but um, we have some more time here for questions from board members until before we go to public comment. And one of the things I do want to do at the end, uh, before we adjourn today, uh, I want to run through some of the topics that you are interested in, in having set aside or specified for mm -hmm. some of our upcoming meetings. So make sure we cover some of these things we've talked about in more depth. All right, um, if there are no other questions from the board, I'd like to turn this to public to public comment. And if members of the public wish to comment on this, uh, please raise your hand uh, by either through the Zoom raise your hand function. If you're on the phone, do it by pressing star and nine. Um, the staff will, will assist us in identifying attendees. When you are recognized, um, please say your name, give your address for the record. Try to keep your comments to about three minutes. I will endeavor to tell you when you've uh, gotten close to that time um, so we can have um, as many people speak as, as wish to. So if members of the public wish to speak, this is the time to so indicate uh, time for public comment. So we have one person so far. Um, I can go ahead and give that person speaking permissions. Yep, please do. All right. Hello, is that me? Yeah, uh, you, you read, you're identified as Lawrence, if that's you. Yes. Okay. Uh, name I guess, yes, I'm sorry, the, the lighting is not, uh, I don't know how to do this. If Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. We can hear you. just need your name and address, and then you can proceed. I'm Lawrence Quigley, 35 Ball Lane in Amherst. Great. Uh, uh, bless all of you for doing this uh i'm not uh, a professional at this uh i am an abutter uh and i live on a private lane uh, uh i want to make it clear that i support this endeavor and i'm astonished at uh, Jeff jessica allen's ability to keep all of this in her head uh and grateful to everybody who stays up late uh i'm i'm up late uh, 
I want to um, point out uh, that there's a wildlife corridor, the state tracks, the bears that come through. I just like someone to be paying attention to what happens to the wildlife corridor. Uh, and that, I don't know how to ask someone to do that, but would someone please track the wildlife corridor that's going to be disrupted? Uh, the other part of this is that uh, I have a covenant on my property of who gets to pass through. Uh, I'm at the end of Ball Lane, so I'm the end. 35 is the end. There is a 40, which used to be 20, just so everyone... It used to be a 20 on the building, the, the apartment uh, at 40. It, it, the, the, the two got taken down and a four got put up. Uh, 20 used to be uh, Medusco's garage. Uh, but uh, my, under, my lawyer's understanding of who gets to walk by my house is uh, for the residents at 40 and the residents at the uh, 38 and 36 get to walk by, uh, but not the uh, agents of 40 or 36 or 38. Uh, so there's going to be a question of a public, uh, a, a byway out of this development along Ball Lane. That's going to be contested. Uh, I wish you would change the uh, address to 190 Montague Road, where you're going to be coming in from. Uh, and uh, it, whenever there's any advertising about 20 to 40 ball lane, cars come through for days looking for 20 to 40 ball lane uh, down the lane. It's a private lane. Uh, if you change the advertising address to 190 Montague Road, they would go in that way and it would not be an interruption. So uh, those are my concerns. Uh, thank you all for doing this very good thing that I'd like to support. And uh, I'd like, I don't know who to talk to about those concerns. And uh, Jessica, if you don't mind, I'll call you tomorrow and ask who to talk to in the town about those concerns. The the wildlife corridor and that I have a covenant to my property that allows some people to go by and nobody else. Uh, and I'd like that concern to be addressed. So I, I turn it over. I, I don't really, I'm going to try to go back to unmute or try to go back to mute. Mr. <laughs> I can, I can Very answer much. the question about the address if that would be helpful. Uh, what we'll do Al, uh, Ms. Allen, we'll, Give you an opportunity to respond to all the sure. public comments once okay. they're yep so keep uh notes on what you want to say to that that'd be great um other people who wish to make a statement express a concern going once going twice oh oh, oh never mind there was one yeah there was one. Oh, raise hand again all right mr stephen hey. king i will allow for you to talk Mr. King, you're muted. Yeah, I see. So thank you. I, I'm Stephen King. It's actually my wife who's sitting next to me who was who is going to speak. All right. Um, we don't want to reiterate the letter that we sent. Yeah, yeah. Who, name, name, address. Address. Page 208 Montague Road. Thank you. We own the property on Pulpit Hill Road, 28 Pulpit Hill Road, on the both sides of the corner abutting this. And I want to encourage you to read. The letter that we sent, and uh, I don't want to repeat the whole thing, but we're very in favor of this project for all the reasons that have been stated. But we also think it's really important for North Amherst to have uh, these 30 families who own their homes. Um, so I don't want to repeat the letter, but this is a terrific project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other, other people who wish to speak? Not seeing any. No? All right. Um, Ms. Allen, do you want to respond to the question that we had uh, from Lawrence um, regarding address and- Sure. Uh, 
So it was our hope to be able to switch the property address to Montague Road, um, number to be determined by the town. Um, how Before we filed the permit, we really wanted to try to keep the address the same throughout this entire permitting process and when we get to the building permit process. The complexity is that the property that we, um, the rental that is on the property has an address of 40 Ball Lane. So um, we need to be able to subdivide that property as part of our proposal. And I should have put that in the, one of the waivers. It's kind of one of the major ones, and that's an oversight on my part, is to be able to subdivide up, um, the, the rental off of the rest of the property because we intend to sell that and use those proceeds to contribute to the construction of the project. Um, so we can't subdivide until we get approval from the ZBA to be able to do that because it's on a, the frontage doesn't meet the frontage requirements and it's on a private way. So we would either have to come before the ZBA to get a separate variance, but we'd like to try to incorporate it as part of the, the um, comprehensive permit. So that's hence why the address continues to be on Ball Lane for the moment until we get through permitting and we're able to um, officially subdivide that piece off then we're able to change the address. We've already had conversations with DPW to be able to do that, and they're fully aware of it. Mr. Wachill, do you want to respond oh. to that? Well, I just want to um, reinforce what she's saying um, about the change of address. So, you know, it's not uncommon for these permits to be granted, uh, and I'm speaking more about other land use permits um, as well, that the address gets changed because they usually create more units, um, or if it's a subdivision, usually you would create new addresses and usually the person who determines street addresses is the building commissioner. And in this regard, if the ZBA wanted to accommodate the change of address, they could condition it if they wanted to, uh, just so it's on the record. Um, usually a way to identify this property in the future is using the parcel number from the assessor's map, which is the most accurate way to determine, you know, to identify the property. Um, it's very common for street addresses to change pretty often uh, throughout a property's history. So, I mean, this wouldn't uphold anything down the road, but it's wise to consider it as a condition um, if that's what the applicant wants to do. Mr. Henry? And for, for you, Rob, and for Jessica, if, if the current property gets subdivided and the address gets changed to um, the Montague address, does that satisfy that a voter is concerned about the walk by and access? Will that negate the need to have people walk by that property? Well, I think part of what Mr. Quigley was, was referring to when you put in your GPS system 2040 Ball Lane, it's going to take you down Ball Lane. So with the property address changing to whatever it is, 200 Montague Road, and having unit numbers associated with that address, it would take you to that parking area um, versus bringing somebody down Ball Lane. So I think that's what Mr. Quigley's biggest concern is, is that people see the address 2040 Ball Lane, plug it into their GPS, and it's going to send you straight down that road. And, and Ball Lane is that private way? It's the private way, correct. Yeah. And also the existing curb cuts, according to their site plans, were off of either Montague Road or um, Pulpit Hill Road anyways. So I guess the abutter was just concerned about people just going down the wrong road because that's where the GPS says the address is, even though the entrance isn't actually on Ball Lane. So that might be, is that something that can be resolved by um, just a tagline on when we refer to this as, or when you refer to this property as currently 20 to 40 Ball Lane, and to, it's going to be, can you say something to, that it's going to be uh, 200 Montague Road or some way indicate that that number is going to change so that people who are interested in driving by looking at it know not to go down, but there's another address to look at. You can't keep them from going down Ball Lane, but you can point them and their GPS to a, a different address so they can stop on Montague Road perhaps and look at it. Sure. That may be something you can think about doing to relieve the, the pressure on Ball Lane. It's also why we changed the project name about halfway through. So for many presentations in front of boards, we were calling it Ball Lane Community Homes. Right. And then when we when we made the determination that we were not going to be accessing this property off Ball Lane, we tried to scrap that. But I think, unfortunately, it's still stuck in everybody's heads because that was the initial name that we gave it. So um, that's why it's 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 called Amherst Community Homes in the permit application and no right. longer Ball Lane. Okay. All right. 
Any other responses from the applicant or any other questions from board members? All right, well, this has been um, really helpful, I think, and a, a good introduction to this project, much needed project in our town. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is just before we uh, move on, before we continue this the meeting, um, right now we have plans to go over, we have some, several subjects which we know we, we need to have a focus on in some of our upcoming hearings. Site design and landscape is one. I think that makes some sense. Um, architecture, and maybe we can combine those two, but the site design, landscape, and architecture certainly are sort of the physical plant and the physical location of this project is something I think we could probably start with sooner rather than later. Um, stormwater management there's, and, and the other utilities, I, that may not take a whole meeting, but I think we could perhaps um, identify some time for that. Property management and conditions and, uh, and property management, I think is something that we will want to have some more discussion on. There was obviously concern, not concern, but questions from board members about property management in the future, not just in the um, initial setup, but long-term how it's gonna be managed and held. And I think there's some questions there. I, I also think that there's more questions that have been identified today about income limitations, more information about um, um, about the resale and and we do have questions about local preference. We know that's going to come up and we may, we'll need to have some time to spend on that in the future. And then we'll have to have a meeting on conditions and findings um, going forward. But um, what I'd like to do is task our staff to Rob and Chris to come up with a, a, um, um, a plan for when we, over the next several meetings, how we approach each of these issues and then dedicate some time to them discreetly so that we can focus on them and move on and not kind of scatter shot all over the place. And I think that'd give us a better way to approach this. It'd be more concise. And I think would focus our attention on specific things rather than kind of uh, bring up whatever, uh, something that I do all the time is just bring up whatever comes to mind. And I think if you can focus me and the rest of the board, that'd be helpful to all of us. So Rob, if you can do that, um, and send it out to the board, perhaps before our next meeting, um, our administrative meeting, and we can go over this at that time and approve a schedule of meetings and, and topics. Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, I already um, sent, so I included this in the packet and emailed it to the board earlier, but I have a list of uh, meeting dates here over the next yep. uh, few months. Uh, so as you can tell, most of these are the first and third Thursday with the exception of November 30th, which is the last Thursday in November. Um, and we have this January 4th, which is meeting number six, but before the um, statute limitations of what we can have for the public hearing um, before we have to vote to extend it and have the applicant agree to do so. So January 4th is kind of like that last date, and that's reserved for if we need it. Yep. Um, in terms of the topics, just, just to touch back on what you said. So I recommend keeping architecture and site design and landscaping separate because there's a lot involved with architecture as well. And they talked about having like, four or five different types of units um, and there's probably a lot of discussion that's going to take place as well in the interior design and layout and then uh, the site around the buildings themselves and whatever features exist there um, but I know site design landscape is going to take a, a big chunk of time itself stormwater management will also take a big chunk of time too because they have such an intricate system they're they're placing there but there's yeah. also the concern about um, a high water table too and there might be some discussion on utilities that might be roped into the stormwater part of it as well. Um, so that probably will be a whole meeting itself as well. Um, and then as you said, conditions and findings will most likely have to be the last one because that's right. usually what precedes the vote. Um, so we could do this one of two ways, Mr. Chairman. Um, we could do it where we uh, just pick what topic is discussed at the next meeting according to the schedule that I provide you. Or if you wanted us to put together like a mock schedule and then bring that back at the next zoning board meeting, we could do that as well. I personally no, think the. No, I, I personally, you know, I'd like you to do that, Rob. Yeah. That yeah. way you can you can coordinate with the applicant about yeah. when there are people that can address this can appear at the meeting. I, there was some um, mention that somebody wouldn't be. About, I thought there was a mention earlier that one of the people that would need to be um, mm -hmm. at this 
could, couldn't be to one of the meetings. And so I believe it was a, sure. um, uh, Jessica, if I'm wrong about this, was it your architect that couldn't be there for November 30th? Um, it, we, we are, we are okay now. It was our landscape architect that we okay. thought could not be available on November 30th, but that conflict has been resolved. Um, I also just want to make a note to the ZBA that we're also parallel permitting in conservation commission. So, um, just being aware of that and what's going to be discussed at the concom and i don't i want to make sure that those are kind of coordinated in terms of their discussions i think that's mostly going to be the stormwater piece so but, I, so what i think is, is the best is for you guys is for rob for you to work with concom and work with the applicant figure out a schedule that works which what i think is most important for board members is to make sure that the topics we want to have discovered discussed are on your list and aside from additional sort of income restrictions uh restrictions on sale and um uh, those are i think that we need to have a, have as a um a specific at least a, a topic maybe we don't have to spend a whole meeting on it but other than that i think you have a good list of topics and i open that up for anybody it's another topic that somebody wants to discuss I put it on and then let Rob come up with a schedule and we can review it next week. Uh, Ms. Greenbaum. I, I may be dozing off or something, but did you talk about a site visit and I missed it? Or? We, I said we'd have one, but you didn't miss it yet. Um, we, one is not scheduled yet. We will have one. Well, that much I knew. I didn't know whether they just discussed it now on the list, to-do list. It's, it's something we need to schedule. Yep. I, I, Mr. Chairman, if I could um, interject real quick, I think it'd be wise for us to have a site visit before we get into the topic of site design. Yep. Because that, that would definitely make the most sense. Maybe do it like the week of, or if not the week before. Um, I can always coordinate that with the applicant and just see what works for everybody. Yep. Um, and just go from there. And I mean, does the board have like a specific order they want to go in with the exception of making conditions fines last, or do you want staff to determine that? For you, you know, I think this is. It looks pretty good as it is. I mean, I think the way you've laid it out with the additional discussion of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, applicant selection preference, yep. uh, all those issues regarding who's going to get how people apply for this, how they're subsidized, and how they can dispose of their property or, or sell it. That mm -hmm. I think is a, another topic that's not on here, but. Right. I would go Maybe. with the site design and then architect and stuff. This makes sense. And I'd add the, uh, the financial. Okay. So what if we group that with property management? I mean, would, wouldn't fine. that make, okay. All right. I, I believe, uh, Mr. White, Mr. White. We, you know, I just looked at this. The other thing we need to do is probably we need to go through the waivers that are requested. That's probably oh, true. a topic yeah. that should be, mm -hmm. we should understand that and have that, um, have a discussion about, so we have a discussion amongst board members. So we understand what waivers we are um, granting uh, because we can grant waivers across the board in this um, in this application. So we'll have to find a place that fits in as well with yeah. that one, um, just yeah. because it'd be wise to save that last uh, meeting spot for when we need yeah. it. Um, I believe I believe Mr. Henry and Mr. White also had their hands raised, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. White. Uh, thank you, Chief, Mr. Chair. Uh, so at some point, uh, I would like to have a discussion about the comment from Mr. Lawrence about the wildlife corridor being disrupted. Um, just a little bit more detail on that, um, kind of what we're looking at with that. Great. That can probably be done in the site design landscape. Yeah. That'd be a good spot for that. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Henry. I think you mentioned, Mr. Chair, the financials. I'm, I'm very interested in that and how people will qualify. I also believe that um, Ms. Allen committed to providing details on the deed. So if we can add that into that conversation as well. Um, I'd also be interested if there's any HOA documents being discussed at some point that should be added to um, part of that conversation as well. And also, um, the credit counseling that's being provided for people to qualify. All I think are involved in that same general yes. topics. Yeah. Yep, I agree they with you. All, they can be all grouped together. Like, yeah. 
All right. That's great. Okay, that makes sense, Rob? Yep, so we'll um, put a schedule together, Mr. Chairman, and then uh, we'll bring that to the next zoning board meeting and have the board review and, and improve it. Um, Sounds great. I will stop sharing my screen. Ms. Allen, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to know if there's any comments from the town departments, and I'd like to request that we potentially have those pretty well in advance before we talk about that topic so that we have adequate time to respond to them. As of today, no comments, and the awesome. transmittal was submitted more than 30 days ago. That's great. Okay, perfect. Ms. Murray, you have your hand up. You're keeping keeping us online here, so what... Where are we? Where are we veering off course? Oh no, not at all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one other topic uh, that that um, the board might want to discuss is whether or not you see a need for some peer review consultants, uh -huh. and if so, you know what areas of peer review because that might be something that um, Rob and Christine could start to line up, and that might also affect the schedule as well. That's it's a good point, and it's especially good with stormwater. Um, Something that we don't have that expertise uh, on the board. It's pretty specialized. So uh, another good reason, Rob, to have the stormwater and the site design up front, because uh, those are the ones that would probably require, that I think would, might require some peer review. But I would say as of right now, Mr. Chair, just from staff review of the application materials, it seems like stormwater might be the most likely, but I, I would say it'd be wise to have I guess that hearing first and then the board can determine after the fact if they want to do that. Um, but yeah. it's good. We save that last meeting spot just in case we need it. Yeah. I'd say the ones that those places that we might need peer review should be mm -hmm. in the schedule. Okay. And possible. they, you'd want them first too, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Early right. in the schedule. Ms. Bresper. So I just wanted to mention that this project is going to the Conservation Commission, so they will also be doing an examination of stormwater. So um, you may want to wait until they get into their process a little bit so that we don't have parallel third-party reviews of stormwater management. Um, that's uh, just a suggestion. How long, is that, how long will that, that take? Do you, do you have any idea, Ms. Bresco? I don't know what their um, schedule is. I don't know. Ms. Allen probably knows better than I do about what the CONCOM schedule is for reviewing this project. So I think right now we are tentatively penciled for um, their second meeting in November. We would have made the first one, but the check didn't make it to the town in time. So <laughs> lost in snail mail, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I think we're looking at the, at the I think it's the 22nd um, for uh, first CONCOM. Well, that means that we might be able to have the second meeting on stormwater management on November 30th is a possibility. I think that would make sense. It would be nice to have them sort of tag teaming, but. And the reason it's going to CONCOM is because they deal with a lot of state laws that we can't waive. Is that correct? We have some, yeah, and there's, yes, it has to go to CONCOM because they're state ranks, exactly. Okay, Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, I understand that the uh, Wildlife Corridor is also of state interest, and I don't know whether CONCOM still carries, still is in control of that. They used to be years ago. There is a, a very active Wildlife Corridor that goes from Podick on the west side of 116 all through the PRP in my backyard, up through the golf course. And I can tell you, it is very, very busy with other things besides bears. And uh, I wonder if we might want to think about having somebody tell us more about that. Or are they, are they required to go and see if there are um, species there that are being protected? I'm just asking that as a question. Whose purview uh, is it on a, under a 40B? Ms. Bresto, do you have an answer for that? Uh, no, but I was going to suggest that Rob Wachilla and I talk to um, Erin Jacques, who's the wetlands administrator, and um, talk to her about the wildlife corridor and, and wetlands issues and stormwater management and figure out how we can um, kind of cooperate in managing that. 
This is a good example of one of the complications of 40B is that it requires the staff, principally the staff, to coordinate with all the other boards that would normally be the ones that would have to grant the permit or grant the permission to do this. When we have the many of these issues, you know, 40B all come to us. And so it's incumbent upon us to reach out to all the other bodies in the state, in the town government to make sure that we're uh, apprised of their views. And that really falls on the staff to do that. And so um, they have a, a big job whenever we have one of these. And so you know, it's, just an, it, it's a example of, this is just one example of the kind of work we have to do to coordinate across committees in town. Great. All right, Rob, we'll see you schedule next um, and you'll do some talking with the other, the bodies that we need to talk to, the other the commissions, et cetera. And we can review that schedule at our next meeting. All right, if there's any other questions, I mean, if there's no other questions and other comments, what I'd like to do is entertain a motion that we continue this public hearing on ZBA, let me get the, the ZBA FY 2024-03 Valley Community Development Corporation until our next uh, date of our next meeting date, which is November 2nd at 6 p.m. Do I have such a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Vote is 5-0. Motion carries. It's continued to November 2nd. Um, the next order of business for us tonight is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. This gives an opportunity uh, for the public to speak on anything they wish other than the application that we have tonight. So any public comment on any topic? I see none. The next order of business is any new business. And that's principally what I, normally what we do at this time is, is go over the, the schedule of upcoming meetings. And so Rob, can you just run through it uh, with us for the next uh, couple of meetings and what we have planned? Sure, so um, next week, October 26th, uh, we have a administrative meeting. Um, we're also gonna have a discussion on uh, recent zoning topics that came before the board. Um, we're still trying to figure out what some of those topics are. The building commissioner was hoping to to keep it sort of open to in case members had concerns they wanted to address um, and we can have a discussion on it. And also the building commissioner is going to give us his perspective on, on thinking for a lot of the ways certain sections are interpreted. Um, and then November 2nd is this hearing continued, um, and that'll most likely be the uh, site design and landscaping portion. Um, and then after that, November 9th, we're anticipated to have uh, two special permit hearings scheduled. Uh, the first one is for a change of property management for a rental property, which supposedly needed a um, public hearing in order to change property management for some reason. Um, oh. And then the other, yeah, I know, it, it was a condition from 2018, that's why. Um, and the other one is for a uh, converted dwelling that's non-owner occupied on uh, Lincoln Avenue. Um, and then we have potentially 6-2 Taylor Street coming back. Um, that hearing was continued for that date as well. Um, and then after that, the next meeting for the board won't be until November 30th, which is most likely the stormwater discussion for this 40B permit. And that's pretty much what we have scheduled for right now, Mr. Chairman. Um, and then obviously next meeting we'll have more information for the meetings after that. That's all I have. All right. That's, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for staff or any other new business that members of the board wish to address? In our, in our administrative meeting, is Ms. Murray going to be there? Yes, he will be present. And he may or may not be sending me specific sections tomorrow that we're going to discuss that will include the meeting packets. Um, the meeting packets will be digital because there's not many materials that are going out. Um, and of course, full membership is expected to be there, but it's not mandatory. Unless, Steve, you want it to be mandatory, that is up to you. I'd like everybody to try to make their time. 
the tent. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's also a good time to ask questions and, and you know, to generally talk about the operation of the ZBA. I mean, the, the, all yeah. those topics are open, but I'm, we should focus on some of the hot topics that yeah. we've had before in the last couple of weeks. And there's also meeting minutes that are overdue for approval too. And this will be a good time to approve them really quick. Um, Do that at that next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Again, I was, I want to thank the board members for their willingness to meet on a weekly basis. I know we all like each other, but this is a lot to ask. <laughs> and um, I appreciate all of you doing that. Um, we're going to get to see a lot of each other over the next couple of months and your dedication and commitment is appreciated by me and I'm sure by the town. So thank you very much. Maybe we can meet live and have a party in the winter time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do that. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would entertain a motion. Oh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Aye. All right, it's moved and seconded. That motion is not debatable and it requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Motion is carries. Vote is unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you all. And we'll good see you next. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank night. you. Have a good night.